Good afternoon, and thanks for joining Washington, D.C.-based Jennifer Shasman Associates in our Get Far Sighted in 2020 complimentary webinar series. As you know, the FAR, or Federal Acquisition Regulations, is, a federal, is the rulebook that the federal government must follow in making purchases. Our webinar series pulls from contracting experts to explain each part of the FAR. As complimentary and recorded, we will post all of the recordings on our website and YouTube channel where we have over 300 government contracting webinars available for download. A special thanks to our webinar partner in this series, the National Veterans Small Business Coalition Education Foundation. Please visit their website to learn more about the organization. We would also like to thank our friends at Open the Fire for the sponsorship. If your organization is interested in sponsoring the series or one part, please contact hello at jennifershouse.com. And now a little bit about us. We work with primarily large businesses to help them navigate the federal marketplace. We work with product and service companies as well as software firms. Our clients span the globe and include publicly traded organiza organizations in a variety of sectors. We provide market analysis reports, contract administration, contract vehicle systems, and more. All of our services can also be built into a training course for your team. Learn more about us on our website. And now we would like to let you know about some ways to reach government, the government and government contractors through us. We offer advertising and sponsorship opportunities through our weekly newsletter and also in our webinar series. For pricing or to place an order, please email us at hello at jennifershouse.com. All right, and now let's move on to learn a bit, a, bit, a bit about today's speaker, Robert Wink. You can see his contact information on the screen here. And today we are covering FAR Part 32 with Robert. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're really thankful for your participation in the series. The floor is now yours, and uh, please let me know when you're ready for your next slide. Uh, thank you for having me today. Uh, we're going to be discussing FAR Part 32, Contract Financing. Next slide. FAR Part 32 covers contract financing. Before we get into it, I want to talk about uh, FAR Part 9. Uh, it's actually the qualification, uh, qualifying, determining responsibility. So the reason why this is important is uh, for that in contract financing, this also discusses determining uh, a vendor responsible to see if they actually have the financial capability to actually perform. But FAR Part 32 also discuss ways of advanced payments and other methods of uh, payment to help uh, support anybody developing a proposal and their uh, write-up on how they plan on financing if that's requested. So in accordance with FAR subpart 9.104-1A as an alpha, to be determined responsible, a prospective contractor must have adequate financial resources to perform the contract or the ability to obtain them. That could see a 9.104-3 alpha Ability to obtain the resources, except to the extent that a prospective contractor has sufficient resources or proposes to perform the contract by subcontracting. That's usually seen in construction or research and development. You also see small businesses doing that as well. The contracting officer shall require acceptable evidence of the prospective contractor's ability to obtain required resources. That can be seen in 9.104-1 alpha Echo and Foxtrot. The acceptable evidence normally consists of commitment or explicit arrangements. That would be in existence at the time of the contract award to rent, purchase, or otherwise acquire the need facilities, equipment, or other resources, personnel. Uh, when I look at resources and even the contracting, they also talked about finance as well. And that's when you get into your Echo and your, uh, your E here is having the necessary organization experience, accounting, and operational controls. Um, or the ability to obtain them, including as appropriate such elements as production control procedures, property, et cetera. But the biggest thing is accounting and finance. Uh, next slide, please. How does the contracting officer determine financial responsibility? That is seen in subpart 9.105-1. They can obtain the information by financial co competence and credit needs, pre-award surveys, other sources such as publications, suppliers, subcontractors, customers of the prospective contractor, financial institutions, government agencies, businesses, and trade associations. The reason, uh, and how does this relate to FAR Part 32 contract financing? In my experience as a contracting officer for seven years, now that I'm on the program side and have my own uh, business, what I've noticed on the cost reimbursement side, this is very important. When it comes to firm fixed price, I did not see this as much. I mainly, a firm fixed price uh, contracts, usually a vendor will sit there and state, hey, I can perform the work, and the government says it's fine, it's good to go. That's been my experience. Uh, there, there hasn't been uh, the need to do a lot of termination and finance, financial responsibility. 
every agency does it differently. And what I mean by that, the Corps of Engineers, the Army uh, Fort Hood MIC, Mission Installation Contracting Command, I was down there as well, and even at FEMA, and I deployed throughout the state of Texas and Louisiana, supporting a, a FEMA and disaster contracting as well. Every one of them has a different document that they'll use to determine responsibility. So it's a, it's a checklist, they'll go through it, and some will ask for the financial documentation, others won't. So uh, how does this relate to the FAR Part 32 contracting and financing? Well, let's go to the uh, next slide. FAR Part 32.00 scope of the, uh, this part, this part describes policies and procedures for contract financing and other payment matters. So this is why it's applicable. This part will address the payment methods, including partial payments, progress payments, based on percentage or stage of completion, loan guarantees, advance payments, and progress payments based on cost, administrations of debts to the government arising out of contracts, contract funding, including the use of contract clauses, limiting costs or funds, assignment of claims to aid in private financing, selecting payment clauses, financing of purchase, purchases of commercial items, performance-based payments, and electric fund funds transfer payments. Just kind of scope on number G, uh, this is taken out of the FAR. Uh, G also, will, uh, I did not go into depth on cost reimbursement contracts. It is covered in FAR Part 32, but majority of the vendors, and in my experience, is firm fixed price. When you start going into cost reimbursement, there has to be uh, adequate scope of uh, quality assurance available and an accounting system and stru structure in place to uh, pursue those. So those are very, it's a small field, uh, mainly in research and development. I've seen it in disasters as well and also at the Corps of Engineers. But I won't be covering the uh, financing of purchases for cost reimbursement. Uh, I'll be looking at commercial items of firm fixed price. Next slide. Contracting, contract finance payments means that an authorized government disbursement of monies to a contractor prior to acceptance of supplies or services by the government. Contracting, contract finance payments include advance payments, performance-based payments, commercial advance and interim payments, progress payments based on the cost under the clause of 52.232-16, which is progress payments, progress payments based on the percentage or stage of completion, interim payments under a cost reimbursement contract, except for cost reimbursement contract for services when alternate I of the clause 52.232-25 prop payment is used. And then going to number two, uh, contract financing payments do not include invoice payments, payments for partial deliveries, or lease and rental payments. Next slide. Payment methods, including partial payments and progress payments based on percentage or stage of completion. Partial payments, uh, payment amount that is less than the due amount, that's part payment for an unfinished work or an installment payment. Progress payments are, the government will make progress payments to the contract requesting its work progress, but not more than frequently than monthly. This is also an amount of 2,500 or more approved by the contracting officer. I see this in construction contracts, and also in uh, A&E contracts, that's in FAR Clause 52.232-16, the dash 5 and dash 10, uh, with progress payments. Progress payments based on percentage or stage of completion, the basic authority for this contract financing describes the parts contained in 41 U.S.C. Chapter 45, but also contract financing 10 U.S.C. 2307, and the Title III Defense of Production Act of 1950. The basis of payment on particular particular payments under section 4501 of this title shall be made on any of the following basis. Performance measured by objective, quantifiable methods such as delivery of acceptable items, work measurement, or statistical process controls, accomplishment of events to find the program management plan, and other quantifiable measures of results. Very simple. It's it's uh, you can call them bitch marks, you can call them milestones. It's in the contract structure that if you complete this certain amount of progress, it's validated, submit invoice, you'll get paid. Next slide. Now, loan guarantees, we're on Bravo, loan guarantees, advance payments, and progress payments based on cost. 
Loan guarantees are made by Federal Reserve Banks on behalf of the designated guaranteeing agency to enable contractors to obtain financing from a private source under contracts for the acquisitions of supplies or services for national defense. That can be seen going on with uh, the whole COVID-19 and mask and uh, medical equipment and supplies that are needed. Advanced payments are advanced advances of money by the government to the prime contractor before an ant anticipation of for the purpose of complete performance under one or more contracts. They are expected to be liquidated from payments due to, con due to the contractor incident to the performance of the contracts. Since they are not measured by performance, they differ from partial or progress payments or other payments based on the performance of partial performance of contract. Advanced payments may be made to the prime contractor for the purpose of making advance advances to subcontractors. Progress payments based on costs are made on the basis of costs incurred by the contractor as work progresses under the contract. This form of contract financing does not include payments based on the percentage or stage of completions, completion accomplished. Two, payments for partial deliveries accepted by the government. Three, partial payments for a contract termination proposal. And number four, performance-based payments. Next slide. Hmm. Going to uh, administrative debts to the government arising out of contracts. FAR subpart 32.6 contract debts. This occurs actually, uh, believe it or not, quite often. There's checks and balances, and we'll discuss some of these. This subpart describes policies and procedures for identifying, collecting, and deferring collection of contract debts, including interest, if applicable. Contract debts are the amounts that have been paid to the contractor, which the contractor is not currently entitled under the terms and conditions of the contract or otherwise due from the contractor under the terms and conditions of the contract. Contract debts include, but are not limited to the following. One, billing and price reduction results from contract terms for price re redetermination or for determination of prices under incentive type contracts. Two, price or cost reduction for defective certified cost pricing data. Three, Financing payments determined to be in excess of the contract limitations. Progress payments, performance-based payments, or any other contract clause for commercial items. Number three happens quite often. I saw this at the Corps of Engineers. I've seen this at FEMA. And I've seen this in Fort Hood, Texas. A vendor submits an invoice. It goes to finance to review it. Finance will send it to the uh, requiring activity to make the payment. The requiring activity will, they have their own accounting sheet. They'll refer it to review it, and they'll, Bless off on payments. Uh, there is human error. Sometimes payments are done, uh, they'll make the payment and they should not have received payment. That may be because of a delivery wasn't done or that the monthly service uh, may have not been performed. Also, and this happens quite often where a vendor will invoice multiple times. That That is because they're a bigger agency, they're a bigger um, business. And I see, I've seen this with, uh, some construction companies, some IT companies, and it's actually big in rental cars. Although invoice multiple times for the same thing, it's just a, uh, when you have three or four people from a business standpoint working those uh, financial uh, uh, accounts uh, payable and they're submitting those off, uh, sorry, receive, yeah, when they're submitting those off, you'll come across those concerns as sometimes, you know, payments do occur. There's also number four, increase to, to financing payment liquidation rates. Number five, overpayments disclosed by quarterly statements required under price redetermination or incentive contracts. Six, price adjustments resulting from cost accounting standards, non-compliance or changes in cost accounting practice. Number seven, reinspection costs for non-conforming supplies or services. Next slide. Duplicate or erroneous payments. This also occurs happen where a vendor will submit a payment, it's rejected, and it is uh, resubmitted again and approved. They resubmit it under a different number and it gets approved again. It happens. It's a very simple fix. Uh, another thing is damages or excess costs related to defaults in performance. Nine, that's where the government actually will do a claim against the vendor saying you've damaged property or there's some excess of costs. Ten, Breach of contract obligation concerning progress payments, performance-based payments, advance payments, commercial item financing, or government furnished property. 11, government expense of correcting defects. That is if a vendor simply, um, there's a defect in the equipment, the vendor refuses to fix it, and the government goes outside 
to uh, outside of the uh, original contract because of the vendor's refusal and get somebody else to fix the work. Overpayments related to errors in quantity or billing or deficiencies in quality, quality uh, that occurs as well. And number 13, delinquency and contractor payments due under agreements or arrangements for deferral or postponed of collections. 14, reimbursement of payments due under 33.102 Bravo 3 and 33.104 H Hotel 8. Uh, 33.102, um, require the awardee to reimburse the government's costs as provided in this paragraph. A postponed protest is sustained as you resolve an awardee's intention or negligent misstatement, rep misrepresentation or miscertification, in addition to any other remedy protest to the agency. Basically, a, uh, a, uh, a vendor protest, it's, uh, it's negligent, it's not correct, and there are certain vendors out there that actually will continuously protest. This is the government's way of saying, hey, we're going to do a charge against you, send you a, a debt letter because you're holding up progress and it's not accurate. But these are vendors that are uh, habitual user, that habitually do it. And then 33.104 H8, it's the same as above, that's a 33.102. Next slide. <clears throat> what if a business owes a debt to the government? Their responsibilities is the contracting officer has to identify and demand payment. And thus the error is made by payment by the payment office. Debt determination. If the contract officer has any indication that the contractor owes money to the government under a contract, the contracting officer shall determine promptly whether the actual debt is due and the amount. The amount of indebtedness determined by the contracting officer shall be the amount that is based on the merits of the case and that's consistent with the contract terms. Usually there's it's based off claim structures or the pricing structure or pricing schedule, and that's what they'll use to determine. Or they may go back to the vendor and say, Hey, what is uh, what was the cost of this? Prime example would be a firm fixed price contract, and the pricing isn't broken down. Then the contracting officer will submit a demand for payment, uh, issue the demand for payment as soon as the contracting officer, officer has determined that it is an actual debt that is due to the government and the amount, which shall include the description of the debt, the amount of debt, line item number and amount, basis of the incurred interest, and a statement advising the contractor on the contracting officer and the process of payment. The final decision, basically this is where the contractor will come back and say, no, I disagree with it or I agree with it and it should be this. Well, the contracting officer will do their final decision through their due diligence. They will either agree with the contractor or they will not. Then they will send a certified mail return receipt requested for it to the copy to the payment office. So one will go to the vendor, the contracting officer will keep one for his record, and then he'll send one to the payment office so that they're aware of the uh, that there's an outstanding debt. Installment payments and deferment collection. The contracting officer shall not approve or deny a contractor's request for installment payments or deferment of collections. The office designated agency procedure is responsible for approving or denying requests for installment payments or deferment collections. In short, this is simply saying, hey, the vendor goes, hey, yes, we owe you the payment. Instead of paying the 400,000, 500,000 that we owe you, can we do it in payments? or can we defer it to collections in due time? Next slide. All right, contract funding included the that use the contract clauses, limited costs or funds. Policy 32.72, no officer or employee of the government may create or authorize an obligation excessive funds available or in the advance of appropriation, also an Anti-Deficiency Act, unless otherwise authorized by law. Before, before executing any contract, the contracting officer shall obtain written assurance from the responsible fiscal authority that adequate funds are available, express conditions of contract upon availability of funds accordance with 32.703-2. If the contract is fully funded, funds are obligated to cover the price or target price of the fixed price contract or the estimated cost of any of the cost reimbursement contract. If the contract is incrementally funded, funds are obligated to cover the amount lauded and the correspondence of increment of fee. So what does all that mean? Pretty straightforward. A government employee, and this happens on the program office side, the contracting officer represents. So what happens is the vendor goes to a government employee and goes, I can do X, Y, Z for you. And now the government employee, that sounds great, but there's a process. The government employee actually has to do market research, go to uh, submit the uh, purchase request with the market research to finance, make sure finance is available. There's multiple approval levels that happens in this, and then it finally goes to contracting. Now, what 
this this is what's supposed to happen. What may happen is, and this is two instances that do occur, and it's actually quite common, is that what will happen is program office, you know, or a COR will go out, find a vendor that wants to buy, you know, they want furniture. Easy example. They want furniture. The furniture, uh, they talk to the vendor, and their vendor goes, yeah, you know, I like the furniture. The, the program office, the COR goes, hey, I like that furniture. It looks good. Let's get it. Well, the vendor then orders it. Ships it to the government and demands payment. Well, that's anti-deficiency. There wasn't the proper approval process by that employee. The employee cannot obligate the government. So that's that's why that occurs for anti-deficiency. And then what also may occur is during construction is that construction is occurring, there's extra material left over, and it could either be the employee or it can even be the contractor. They discuss and they go, hey, you know, we have extra material. We can do this for you. We can build an additional room. We could build, uh, or we could build you a dog house. And the employee goes, that sounds great. Or the employee goes, hey, you have extra material. Can you build me a dog house? Well, that's, a, that's, that's, a, that's an anti-deficiency act. They're not authorized to do it. They're changing the scope of the contract. Now, upon availability of funds. Now, this is a, an important topic. Is FAR Clause 52.232-18, availability of funds. Uh, a lot of times you'll see this in government contracts and it's misused. If you look at the prescription, it says for funding crossing fiscal years, like 52.232-19, or it could be used in the part of, hey, uh, incremental funding. Funds aren't available and it's only available from January through May. Once more funds are available, we'll put it on the June through, or sorry, correction, July through August or September, for example. That's saying that there's no funds currently, that there will not be funds available and uh, it's just a warning, it's a clause. A lot of times you'll see contracting officer specialists use it as there is no funds available and we're not gonna award this contract until funds are available. That occurs as well, just letting you know there's a difference uh, between those two languages and, uh, and, and 52.232-19, availability funds for the next fiscal year. What that basically states is September 30th is cutting off, Funding is not available. You'll see this in contracts that are awarded around October 1st through 10th, even to the 15th, saying uh, you'll see them in, um, what's the best one? Utilities. Utilities is a good one. Well, operations still have to continue, so there's a letter that goes to the contractor saying, hey, funding's not available, but we're authorized to continue services. Because of this clause, once funding's there, we'll, we'll obligate it towards you. So that does occur. The only clause and this is a supplemental clause in the Air Force, is MP232-7. You may see this clause, it basically says, notice to offer suppliers, funds are not presently available for this effort. No award will be made under this solicitation until funds are available. The government reserves the right to cancel the solicitation either before or after the closing date. In the event the government cancels the solicitation, the government has no obligation to reimburse an offer for any cost. Now, other agencies will use this uh, language and they'll use it for uh, upon availability of funds. And it's a great thing to use. If you see that in a solicitation, you'll see it mainly toward the end of year. So we're talking July through September. And the reason is they're waiting for what's called fallout money. Next slide. Contract funding, including the use of contract clauses, limited, limiting costs for funds. Clauses to look for is 52.232-20, limitations of cost, and 52.232-22, limitations of funds. 32207, limitation of cost of funds. Basically, all that is is saying, the government is saying, hey, uh, usually it's cost reimbursement, time material. You're hitting 80% uh, of the amount, and there's only 20 we don't have the funding for the remaining. Or you're about to hit your cap. So basically, what that says is, the additional, we have to note, the contracting officer has to notify you upon learning the contractor is approaching those estimated funds, additional funds have been allotted, or the estimated cost has been increased in this specific amount. The contract is not to be further funded, and that the contractor should submit a proposal for adjustment of fees, so any changes, additional work, or the contract is to be terminated. The government's basically gonna say, we have additional fees to increase the, the estimated costs. The contract is entitled to the contract terms to stop work and the funding or cost limit is reached. And any work beyond the funding or cost limit will be the contractor's risk. So any work for after that, it's your risk. The government's not gonna pay you. 
government personnel encouraging the contractor to continue work in the absence of funds where occur a violation of revised statute section 3679. Basically, it's, it's a violation of law. Civil or criminal penalties can occur. Next slide. Assignment of claims to a private financing. In my experience, this is a, by experience, I've always tried to stay away from assignment claims. There's a lot of additional work with it. But the conditions are shown in 32, far part 32.802. Under the assignment of claims, a contractor may assign monies due or to become due under a contract if all the following conditions are met. The contract specifies a payment aggregating $1,000 or more. The assignment is made to a bank, trust, or other financial institution or federal lending agency. The contract does not prohibit this assignment. That's FAR Clause 52.232-24. Unless otherwise expressly permitted in the contract, the assignment covers all unpaid amounts payable under the contract, is made only to one party, except that any assignment that may be made to one party or a, as an agent or trustee of two or more parties participating in the financing and the contract, and it's not subject to further assignment, meaning you cannot transfer it. The assignee sends a written notice of assignment together with a true copy of the assignment instrument to the contracting officer or the head of the agency, surety, surety on the bond applicable to the contract, an dispersing officer designated to the contract in the contract to make payment. Next slide. <clears throat> Assignment claims to aid in private, fin private financing. Look for these clauses. FAR Clause 52.232, Assignment of Claims. This basically says that you're authorized to do it, and uh, Assignment claims may assign its rights to paid amounts due to or become due as a result of performance of this contract to a bank, trust, or other financial institution. There's no reassignment available. Um, and then the contractor shall not furnish or disclose any assignment under the contract or any classified documents, meaning if it's a classified contract, because the company you're working with that's providing the financing, you cannot provide them classified information. And then FAR Clause 52.232-24, for prohibitation of assignment of claims, that basically says the government will not entertain uh, doing any assignment of claims to a banking institution. Next. Next slide, please. Select payment clauses. Each payment clause has a prescription instructions. I, I basically, on this here, I listed all the payment clauses. So what I tell everybody to do is make sure when you read, you see your payment clauses, 52.232-1 payments, you got FAR Clause 52.232-8, discount payments. All these clauses are very applicable, uh, especially with progress payments and 52.232-16. Depending on the type of contract that you're working with, cost reimbursement, firm fixed price, these clauses will be in there. However, if you're doing construction, research and development, audiovisual, prime example. I was working on an audiovisual contract that was uh, around $500,000 uh, at a prior agency, it's $500,000, and the vendor said it would take one month to do. Pretty simple, one month. What ended up happening, this ended up being, uh, there was a, uh, the vendor requested a uh, increase, a change in schedule, an additional 90 days, so it was a four-month project, and they had to carry $500,000 of this whole entire project for the 120 days or four months. They came back to the agency uh, and they asked, can we put in progress payments? Can we alter the contract? The end result, the answer was no, but that's why it's, it's a lessons learned. Look at your clinch structure and look at your uh, each payment clause and make sure, it's, uh, make sure that it gives you the capability and flexibility to do what's best for your uh, business. So if you're reviewing these clauses and they're not there and it will support your business, you can always bring it up to the government during the solicitation phase so that it can be most advantageous to you and other vendors. Next slide, please. Furthermore, limitations of funds, assignment of claims, these are additional clauses, talk about prompt payment and uh, supporting, uh, and also accelerated payments to small business subcontracting. Uh, the reason I bring up FAR Clause 52.232-40, accelerated payments to small business subcontractors. When you're working with small businesses and they're your subcontractors, and this is even a small business to a small business, every state has a different applicable uh, law of, you know, I think California says seven days, Texas is seven days, I believe Florida is 10 days. 
So those applicable laws in the state, depending on the vendors you're working with, you can use those in your flow down clauses to your subcontractors. I've also seen very big in construction contracts that once the prime contractor is paid, within seven days they pay the subcontractor. So that's also important to know as a subcontractor to see when you'll get paid. So that's also talks about uh, if you have the financial capability, it's about risk. Next slide, please. <clears throat> G, finance of purchase, financing of purchase of commercial items. This FART provides and procedures for commercial financing arrangements under commercial purchase pursuant to FAR Part 12, 32.10201. This is important. The head of the agency determines are appropriate or customary in the commercial marketplace or in the best interests of the United States. When I'm using a financing in contracts, it is responsibility of the contractor to provide all purposes, all resources, all resources needed for the performance of this contract. Thus, for purchase of commercial items, financing of contract is normal. The contractor's responsibility, however, is in some markets, provision of the financing, the buyer is a commercial practice. In circumstances, the contracting officer may include appropriate financing terms and contracts for commercial purchases when doing the best interest of the government. Next example I'll say on this is that the government pays in the rear. And what I mean by that is vendor provides a supply, they provide a service. The government will, you as the vendor will invoice and the government pays you. Whereas usually, um, if I buy something on Amazon or anywhere, I pay for it and then I get the item. Well, the government's reversed. Now where this is applicable is big in uh, real estate. So uh, when at FEMA, they'll use, um, they'll use uh, disaster funds to rent rental pads, uh, rental pads for RVs and um, apartment complexes and uh, manufactured home units uh, space. Well, customary is that the vendor gets paid up front. So this is where a, uh, so if you're on their RV park, this is where you'd bring up, hey, I wanna do a different change, I recommend this, we get paid up front. It would be ultimately up to the head of the con ed contracting agency to make that determination to do it yes or no. From my experience uh, working at FEMA during the uh, rental properties, uh, mobile homes, units, and uh, pad leases, we're still paying in the rear. Uh, that's what they're doing still. Um, but as a business owner, you guys can bring that up. The authorization for commercial interim payments and commercial advance payments may be made under the following circumstances. The contract item finances commercial supplier service. The contract price exceeds the acquisition, simplified acquisition threshold, which is $250,000. Now, during a disaster, FEMA can push that up to $750,000. Just a food for thought. The contract officer determines that it is appropriate or customary in the commercial marketplace to make financing payments for the item. Authorizing this form of contract financing is the best interest of the government, and the adequate security is obtained. The contracting officer may approve that, hey, yeah, this sounds great to do this customary finance payments, but it's ultimately up to the head of the agency to determine to do it or not. Next slide, please. Prior to any performance work under the contract, the aggregate of commercial advance payments, uh, we're talking about advance payments. So this is very important. Uh, prior to any performance work under a contract, the aggregate commercial advance payments shall not exceed 15% of the contract price. Some vendors will sit there and try to say, hey, I want payment up front, all of it up front. Well, the government's going to allow up to 15% of where the contract price is. We'll discuss more of that shortly. The contract is awarded on the basis of competitive procedures, or if only one offer is solicited, adequate consideration is obtained based on time value of the additional financing to be provided. If the financing is expected to be substantially more advantageous to the offer than the other others offers normally normal method of customary financing. Eight, the contracting officer obtains concurrence from the payment offices concerning liquidation provisions when required. If it's unusual contract financing, that's uh, not to accord the requirements of the agency regulation, but it's to commercial industry. It has to be approved by the head of the contracting. And it's in the best of interest of the government. Next slide, please. <clears throat> financing of purchase of commercial items. FAR subpart 32.202, types of payments for commercial item purchases. These are the definitions, incorporate the requirements of statutory commercial financing under the prompt payment. 
commercial advance payments are used in this subsection, meaning it's a payment made before any performance of work, the aggregate of these payments shall not exceed 15%. When this does occur, that there has to be security for the government financing. It requires the government to obtain some type of adequate security for government financing from the vendor. The contracting officer shall specify in the solicitation the type of security and the government will accept. The value of the security must be less, at least equal to the maximum unliquidated amount of the contract financing payments to be made to the contractor. Here are the types of securities. Paramount lien, other assets and securities, other forms of security. This could be an error irrevocable letter of credit from a federally insured financing institution, bond from a surety, a guaranteed guarantee of repayment from a personal corporation of de demonstrated liquid net worth, connected by significant ownership to the contractor, titled to identified contractor asset, assets of adequate worth. Next slide. Performance-based payments. FAR subpart 32.101B, Performance-based payments are contract financing payments that are not payment for accepted items. FAR subpart 32.101E, performance-based payments shall not be used for payments under cost reimbursement line items, contracts for architectural engineering services or constructions, shipbuilding, ship conversion, alteration or repair, when contracts provide for progress payments based upon percentage or stage of completions, or contracts awarded through sealed bid procedures. FAR subpart, my mistake, 31.002, based on performance-based payments. Performance-based payments may be made on any of the following basis. Performance measures, measured by objective, quantifiable methods, accomplish, accomplishment of defined events, and other quantifiable measures of results. Next slide. Continued FAR subpart 32.102. 1004 procedures, performance-based payments may be made either on whole or contract on a developer-based item. That's otherwise prescribed by the agency regulation, financing payments who made whole contract based on the pickle entire contract. So this, this basically goes down to clean structures and the items. You'll see where one item will say, I need 10 airplanes, and that's at a million dollars each. Uh, so you may be able to do, do a, uh, you know, invoice for all 10. That may be the line. Or you do you may do, and that's one lot, or you may be doing each different line item for each plane. So now it's only one, it's multiple, it's 10 deliverable items instead of one. So this one here is, uh, the deliverable item is a lot, so the 10 million for the 10,000, 10 planes. The established performance base, the basis performance based payments may be either specifically described in events, milestones, or measurable criteria. Each event or performance criteria that will trigger a finance payment shall be an integral necessary part of a contract performance that shall be identified in the contract along with a description that constitutes successful performance event obtained from the performance criterion. And then it will actually trigger another event for a future progress payments on the next event. Um, next slide, please. Electric, electric funds transfer payments. A lot of vendors will ask, well, how do I get paid? When you use SAM.gov, you put your financial information in there. And the government will actually submit you a electric, uh, electric funds transfer. It basically will go to your bank account. And then you'll receive what's called a 1099 miscellaneous at the end of the year. So 32.11100 scope of subpart. This subpart provides policy and procedures for contract financing and delivering payments to the contractor by electric funds. Uh, the applicability that government shall provide all contract payments through EFT except the office makes payments under a contract that requires payment by EFT. They lose the ability to release payments by EFT. The payment is to be received on behalf of a contractor outside of the United States and Puerto Rico. A contract is paid in other than United States currency. This was done in Afghanistan. Uh, it could be done in Iraq as well. The payment, uh, just foreign experience. The payment by EFT under a classified contract would compromise the safeguard of classified information or national security. Arrangements under appropriate EFTs, EFT payments would be impractical due to security considerations. Basically, it's a security contract, um, and it's being done overseas, and tracing the money, that's, that would be the reason why. Uh, next slide, please. Electric funds transfer payments continued. The contract is awarded by deployed contracting officer. This is another reason why they don't do it. Military operations. 
contingency operations, uh, country officer, and conduct emergency operations as a response to natural disaster or national or civil emergencies. If T EFT is not known to be possible, so this would be in a third world country or it could be in a even a country that uh, infrastructure has been um, destroyed due to hurricane, tsunami, or their power uh, is taken out where you can't do electric funds transfer. So that's when checks or cash will be issued. EFT payment will not support the objective of the operation. The AT does not expect to make more than one payment to the same recipient within one year period. Another reason. The AT is need for supplies and service is of such unusual and compelling urgency that the government would be seriously injured unless payment is made by a method other than EFT. There's only one source for supplies of services and the government would be seriously injured unless payment is made by a method other than or otherwise otherwise by the Department of Treasury regulation at 31 CFR part 208. Next slide. Some tips and tricks, some uh, methods that uh, being in my contracting officer experience, then also owning a private company and working with vendors at a uh, city, state and federal level. Uh, when you're at the federal level, I always tell companies, if you're going to look at government contracts, make sure you have for funding for 45 to 90 days in advance. This includes any supplies, material, and payroll. The reason why that is, let's say you're performing and you submit your invoice on day 30. The government has 30 days to approve this invoice. Um, with that being said, it may, you know, they approve it on day 30. It still has to go through finance for their approvals, finance approves, and then it has to go through the EFT transfer process. I've seen vendors that haven't been paid in 12 years. I've seen vendors that haven't been paid in six years. Different agencies, I've seen invoices come late. Um, so that is why, you know, or somebody's on leave or somebody's on holiday and they're out of the office and they're the ones approving the invoice. Oversight does happen. People, you know, miss an email to approve. So if it goes outside that 30 days window, you will start recurring interest. But I always recommend follow up weekly after you submit an invoice. Read the solicitation. The reason why that's important is because certain clauses will allow you to do certain things as far as uh, invoicing, payments, etc. Look at the claim structure, the line item structure, prime reason. You'll see uh, contractors say, or in the government solicitation, it will be a uh, period of performance of one year. Well, guess what? You can't invoice until the one year's over. So once that one year is done, you can invoice for the whole entire year. Recommendation is you say, I want it done in 12 months instead of one year. One year, usually you'll see for uh, software, but it does occur on uh, other uh, services. I've seen it in um, custodial maintenance contracts. I've seen it in janitor contracts. So that is something to be cognizant of when you're looking at a clean structure, make sure it's advantageous to you. And uh, if let's say the line item says one year and you see progress payments, Bar Clause 52.232-16, review it, reach out to the contracting officer, make sure it says 12 months. You always want to check and balance that. Every provision and clause that's in the contract that has 232, or correction, 32 on the end, is what you want to look for and make sure that they don't conflict with each other, they're not ambiguous, and make sure that they need to be in the contract. During the solicitation, ask questions. This is time to bring up any financing questions or request any changes. Remind you, when this is all said and done, the contracting officer has determined that your company is responsible, responsible financially, that you're able to do it. Anytime during the contract, as a contractor, you may always request changes in the contract. That is a written request in accordance with the changes clause at FAR Clause 52.212-4, Charlie, changes, or you can go to any FAR Clause 52.243- insert whatever number and the reason why i'm saying any number is because some may be cost reimbursement same may be firm fixed price it may be incentives review those clauses because this is your contract as well with the government it's a uh, this is where you go okay we don't have the finance capable there's a concern and that's where you go into communication uh this could be hey you need to pull contractors off site because there's a storm coming that's an equitable adjustment you can do or you can do a claim so you really want to talk to the contracting officer as an equitable adjustment. It's about communication and any changes that need done to the contract. You can use those two clauses when it comes to financing to support what you need, but you have to have a valid reason why. And the contracting officer will either concur or not concur and provide a basis. So if you have any questions, um, that's all I have. Next slide. All right. 
Uh, thank you so much for joining us today, Robert. Really appreciate your contribution. Um, if you have any questions, you can contact the speaker with the, con with the contact information you see on the screen. All right, and if you have any questions about federal contracting or need assistance with any of our services, please contact us directly. Thank you again for joining us, and this concludes today's webinar.